Well, Adrian, I think it's time for one of the highlights of this conference. I agree. And uh, break a leg, guys. So I have been so excited about this, and I'm going to introduce you to Ken Dykewald. Uh, but first, a little bit about this session. This is a very special session. It's one of our outstanding breaking silo session because Ken Dykewald is a psychologist. He is a gerontologist. He comes from the world of consulting, and he was one of the first all the way back in 1986. I've been a groupie and a follower of his since 1986 when he founded AgeWave. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in just a moment. And I'm going to break a rule. I'm actually going to read some of his bio because you should know this man. And what he is doing is something he conceived for us. And that is a journey through what is happening with aging today and the current situation, going through what could be if geroscience is uh, as successful as we feel it will be, what could then happen in the farther future for us to live at least through our normal uh, expected biblical lifespan. And then with me a little bit about what happens if we can really make it to that 150? What will society look like? Are we prepared? And so this is gonna be one of these exciting uh, uh, canvases of the present, the near future and the far future with Ken Dykewald. Now, Ken has been for 40 years, a pretty, pretty much our leader in talking about what's going on in the field of aging. Uh, AgeWave, he founded it, he's the CEO, is a think tank, maybe the only think tank, by the way, and consultancy focused on the social and business implications and opportunities for global aging. That means he's an optimist. And his clients, uh, over half of the Fortune 500 companies, uh, has been looking to him and AgeWave to tell them how to structure their products, their services, their thinking when it comes to aging. As a result, he's won a lot of awards. Um, he has been a fellow at the World Economic Forum, a featured speaker at two White House conferences on aging. Next one coming up in 2025. They should invite him for the third time. He's twice received the Distinguished American <coughs> Society on Aging Award for his national leadership. And in 2018, he was awarded the Inspired Award from our International Council on Active Aging for his lasting and really exceptional contributions to active aging industry. So he knows aging. Uh, and now he knows a healthy longevity and he's released two books. He's an author actually of 18 books, but his last two books, both of which I read, this is the one you all need, What Retirees Want, A Holistic View of Life's Third Age, and a memoir, Radical Curiosity, which tells you already a lot about Ken. One Man's Search for Cosmic Magic and a Purposeful Life. And he can get pretty feisty about those 47 uh, those, those um, retirees who spend 47 hours watching TV. Doesn't like that. So this is a leader and this is somebody who talks the talk and walks the walk. I'm throwing that over to you, Ken, uh, because I can't wait to see the journey you take us on. Thank you, thank you so much. And um, I'm gonna be joined by, in addition to you in a little bit, two extraordinary uh, scientists and thought leaders in the whole world of aging and longevity and general science. So let me see if I can get my screen to share here. Give me a second to do the thing we're all learning how to do. And I'll pull it up. Okay, can you see that okay, Adrian? Very good. Okay, so what I'm gonna ask everybody to do is to take all the things you currently think about aging and longevity and medicine, and at least for a little while, park it to the side because in a little bit, Nier and Matthew and Adrian and I are gonna try to mix it up and share with you the way we think about these issues. Uh, by the way, the four of us have never presented together before. Uh, it's likely we will not agree on many things uh, and that's all good. But the idea of it is to at least share with you at this pivotal moment in time, how we think about all of this. So. I'm gonna begin with the myth of Eos that a few of you may be familiar with, but I think it sets the stage. There is a Greek myth that there was a beautiful goddess, an immortal goddess named Eos, and she was the goddess of the dawn. And as fate would have it, she fell in love with a handsome, strapping, powerful warrior named Tithonus. And it occurred to her that because he was mortal, she wouldn't enjoy him for her life, which was immortal. So she went to Zeus, and she asked Zeus for one favor in this life. And that favor was to grant Tithonus 
immortality. And Zeus said to her, are you sure that's what you want? And she said, yes. And as she was leaving Zeus's chamber, she realized she forgot to ask for health. And so as the fable goes, with each year that passed, Tithonius got older and sicker, his bones crumbled, his organs rotted, his brain became demented, but he could never die. So why am I beginning with this fable? Because after having been in this field now for 47 years, I'm hearing all sorts of talk about longevity and anti-aging and not aging and better health and optimal health and wellness. And I feel like in this session, if we can try to clarify what we mean by all this and then point to where we think we're heading, let me also set the stage by sharing this. This is US, but there are similar charts I could pull from all over the world. Uh, this is a chart of the average life expectancy at birth in the United States over the past approximately 1,000 years. And what we have to be struck by is up until the 20th century, most people didn't age, they died. So in the 1850s, couples weren't saying, you know, gee, honey, uh, what should we do in retirement? Because you'd be dead. I also want to point out that our medical system wasn't very expert at the illnesses of older adults because there were so few older adults. It goes beyond that. The length of time it takes for traffic lights to change was geared to the swift movement patterns of young people. Uh, the auditory range in our phones and in our public environments geared to the ears of the young. The skills of our doctors and nurses were oriented towards the acute infectious diseases of predominantly young people. But as you can see, during the 20th century, due to profound breakthroughs in public health and antibiotics and simple thing like refrigeration so we can manage and store foods and uh, spectacular pharmacopoeia that arrived on the scene and the ability to do sophisticated surgical procedures, we began to cobble together, let's call it a modern medicine. And as a result, the average life expectancy, meaning what most people, you know, are going to be living longer and longer. I thought to really uh, kind of rock you guys a little bit, I plotted this out over the past 100,000 years. And what I am profoundly jolted by every time I see that sure there have always been some 50 and 70 and 90 year olds in history but throughout 99 percent of human history the average life expectancy was under 18 and so everything about this is new when you hear near and matt and adrian conjure up their thoughts about the future these folks are at the tip of the spear everything about this is new it has never happened before and the question is what's next People will occasionally ask me, how does that impact sociology? You know, often we think of biology separate from demography and sociology. And I think of them as being sort of dancing partners. So this is a map of the world. And if you look at those regions that are magenta, specifically Italy and Japan, because of higher longevity and low fertility, they are already aged nations. But now I'm gonna click this device I've got in front of me and show you the world in 2050. This is where we're heading and we're heading there swiftly. I'll give you an example. Uh, my son has been living in China, he's 31 most of the last decade. And if you go back to the year 1950, the average life expectancy in China was only 35 years. And the average woman was having between six and seven children. So while filial piety and respect for elders was a core part of the Confucian consciousness and mindfulness, there were very few older people and a huge pyramid base of young people to look after them. Well, China's had this spectacular set of improvements in terms of quality of life and health and well-being. And so their life expectancy is sort of closing in on the U.S. life expectancy but with only 1.4 children per couple on average, the pyramid is turned upside down. So what happens to a nation when there are more older people and fewer younger people? Will our pension systems continue to be fair? Should people continue working only until they're 65? 
at what age are we old? If living to 80 or 90 or 100 or maybe even 150 becomes commonplace. And that takes us to another area. And this is one that after all the years that I've been wandering around in this subject, really been the last five years that this has begun to emerge in discussions. So there's our lifespan, it's called our average life expectancy. And we know that the potential somewhere around 120. So we're doing okay. We're doing better than ever before, let's say in the US living 78 and a half years. But then there's the issue of health span. How much of our life do we spend with health? And that's a provocative question because in fact, you can dial up or down national economies or families ability to support themselves and leave a legacy based on how much of their economics get drained away and how much of their spirit gets broken down if they're not well. I have, uh, I've had the good fortune of giving speeches to about two and a half million people around the world. And in the last decade, I will often begin a speech by saying, how many of you would like to live to 100? Usually about 80% of the hands go up. And then if I say, no matter what, about half the hands go down. And I ask people like, all right, so what's up with that? And they say, well, I don't want to live to 100 if I've got Alzheimer's. I don't want to live to 100 if I'm broken and suffering. I don't want to live to 100 if I'm unable to function as a human being with dignity. And so people are beginning to get aware of the idea that there may be a healthy longevity. But right now, what's happening is a lot of unhealthy longevity. Then that swerves us into another variable, which is, are we good at preventing or dealing with the chronic conditions of age? And I would tell you as an outsider, I'm not a bioscientist, you're gonna hear from Nir in a few minutes, who's both a scientist and a physician. But from where I see it, it seems to me like we're not very good at all. That we have mounting, multiplying chronic conditions, they often cascade one into the other. Our medical system was not designed to either prevent or compress these conditions. So as we age, as many of you know, there are changes and often they're thought about as being unrelated. Circulatory problems, arthritis of the various joints, particularly the lower extremities, varicosity of the veins, orthopedic impairments. And you know, I could really kind of ruin your day. But what's happened is, is that we have begun to map and track people as they age. And what we see is that there are all sorts of things that don't work as well and maybe become diseased as we grow older. And unfortunately, up until let's call it this week at the Metabesity Conference, unfortunately, we often think of these as being individual, unrelated. If I have eye problems, I go to an eye doctor. If I've got a foot problem, I go to a podiatrist. If I've got problems with diabetes, I go to a diabetologist. And so there's this notion or what's emerged is this notion that as we age, we have more chronic conditions, but each one should be considered and dealt with individually. Well, what about if we could envision a lifelong meta health? And by the way, at the risk of being rude, to Tom and Zan and Adrian, I would love to see metabesity change to meta health because I think that's what we're talking about. Are there meta mechanisms? Are there meta approaches to creating health? And is it conceivable that we might be able to live 100 or 120 or 150 years without illness? And the question I'm gonna ask, and I know that Mir and Matt and Adrian are gonna touch on, is, is, are we gonna get there by dealing with an individual condition and an individual person, or is there some meta mechanisms by which we could create healthier humans to go the distance? So here's an example. Here's a woman at 70, who's not in decline, but actually is a competitive runner, also a lawyer. And a few years ago, she got her mom into running also. Ida Keeling passed away this year at 106, but she was an active competitor right up until her last months of life. So are we beginning to see, as we look around us, some examples of a healthier model of aging 
And I'm always reminded of Roger Bannister, the medical student in Great Britain, who broke the four minute mile in a moment in time where nobody thought that was possible. But once he did, within months, everybody started running faster. And within months, thousands of people started breaking four minute miles. Now, from where I sit, to create healthy longevity and to match health span to lifespan, and this again, my opinion, they may not be the same as the extraordinary people you're about to hear from. I think there's a few things that have to change. Number one, we need medical excellence. Do we have it? No. Um, I did a interview with Dr. Jack Rowe a couple of weeks ago. Jack was the founder of the geriatrics program at Harvard. He's 77 now himself, ran Mount Sinai Medical Center, ran the Institute of Medicine's projects on healthy aging. And from Jack's perspective, about 1% of all the health professionals have proper training in dealing with older men and women, 1%. And that the overwhelming majority are maybe very well-intentioned, maybe even extremely talented health practitioners, but there are dimensions of the older body, the older spirit, the older lifestyle, polypharmacy, the complications between one condition and another that most practitioners are winging it. And uh, I realize that that might be really inappropriate for me to say, uh, and I love my personal physician, but we do not have medical excellence when it comes to dealing with healthy aging. Second, oh my, uh, when I was 30, I collaborated on a book with Jonas Salk, who in the 1940s, when he saw poliomyelitis running rampant, he took note of the fact that the general conversation publicly was, boy, are we gonna need more iron lungs in the future? And Dr. Salk, to his credit, Dr. Sabin as well, decided that they would find a way to get to the mechanism that caused polio and turn it off. I'm oversimplifying. We live in a world in the United States alone with 5.8 million people with Alzheimer's and related dementias, 10 times that around the world. Yet the science to wipe out Alzheimer's is insubstantial compared to the need to wipe this disease out. And why are we not wiping out cancer? And why have we not wiped out vascular disease? And why have we not wiped out Parkinson's? We are living in a, in a sea of conditions. And maybe the answer isn't that we should wipe out or turn off a particular condition. Maybe the issue is we need to understand what are the meta dynamics and alter them. Um, in the US, and I don't hold this up as a great example, I hold this up as a middling example. Um, by the way, there are 33 countries in the world that live longer than we do in the United States. And most of those countries have a more compressed period of illness at the end. So we are not a good example of healthy aging or healthy longevity. But we spend a great deal of money on treating conditions, however we do that. But we don't heavy up on the kind of medical research needed so that we could grow old with health and maybe even live longer too. I watched every single minute of every single presidential debate for the last 20 years, and this was not discussed. We talk about giving people access to our current healthcare system versus how do we front end the science so that people don't have these conditions at all. Third, um, how do we take proper care of our own bodies? You know, what should we eat? What do we think about supplementation? Um, how do we interact with medical professionals? How do we know what's real versus what's just some kind of snake oil? You know, I hear about focus ultrasound. I think it sounds incredible. I hear about, you know, harvesting placental cell, uh, cell uh, stem cells. Uh, sounds unbelievable. I hear people talking about a paleo diet, a keto diet. I hear people talking about intermittent fasting. I hear all sorts of crazy stuff now being kind of at the nexus of this aging longevity space. And how do we know, how's the average person to know what they ought to be doing? I would argue that just as ways as emerged as our capacity to create intelligent algorithms has evolved, 
Wouldn't it be neat if Ken Dykel could have maybe not eight or 10 biomarkers, but let's say 500 and have plotted out what a massively healthy 120 year old version of me would be and then have me guided by a health way so that I'm making the right decisions with the right nutrients and the right interventions and the right new medical breakthroughs. So one of the questions that people have is, well, what could we be at 80 or 100 or 150? So I thought I'd throw in just a couple of pictures and then a clip before I hand it off to, to, to Mir. So this gentleman was 80 when his picture was taken. As you can see, he won some medals at a previous athletic event and used to be, I know when my parents were my age, I'm now 71, uh, they would have said, wow, this guy looks pretty good for 80. But here's a picture of another 80 year old more recently taken. And it's a little bit like that Roger Bannister example. Have we not yet seen the future elders? Have we not seen really what a 100 year old might be? By the way, in a minute, Mir, who's the world's expert on centenarians, will share some of his views on that. But let me end and then I'll close up with a television commercial from a few years ago that's one of my favorites. Let's see if I can make this work. So I'd like to, um, before I introduce Dr. Barzilai, I'd like to say that I think we're at an extraordinary moment in history, notwithstanding all sorts of technological apps to deliver groceries and to amuse people in their free time. But I think we're at a spectacular moment when it comes to aging and longevity, where for the first time in history, a great many of us will live long lives. But back to the Eos and Tithonus fable, what kind of long lives will we be living? Healthy, vital, productive, purposeful, or ailing, broken, hobbled, and hurting. And I think it's up to folks like those of you here in this meeting to stop and think, okay, how do we get there? And if we're gonna be healthier, we will therefore also live longer because very few people die of old age. Most people are dying of disease. And then the question sits, which we're gonna to get to in this session, what if there are some other breakthroughs, whether it's CRISPR, whether it's some kind of 3D printing of organ replacements. What about the possibility that in the years to come, we might be able to live 140 or 160 or 180 years? Let me hand this over now to a truly legendary figure on this subject, one of the brilliant minds of our time, maybe the most brilliant mind of our time pertaining to the issues of geroscience, aging, longevity. Nir Barzilai, as most of you know, is the director of the Institute for Aging Research at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Nir, I welcome you and I'm eager to hear your thoughts. Well, Ken, thanks so very much. And I have, I have to tell you, I hate the position I'm in because I want to be the provocateur. And you took the words out of my mouth, okay? And there's nothing I, I can disagree with you all I can do is help double down on what you just said. Um, and I see that you, I gave you some slides and I already don't recognize them. So I'll, I'll go along uh, <laughs> guessing what it is, but uh, we, 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 I was going to mention pathway uh, to longevity. Uh, and, and my thought is pathway to longevity apropos what we can do, whether it's geroprotectors, geroprotectors exercise, diet, or whether it's gerotherapeutics, whether we need drugs for them. And, and of course, the example of the Straubergs from uh, Gulliver travel is actually what you uh, described for EOS. It's, it's they have uh, immortality, 
but they get old and I just want to take it out of here because we don't want those drugs that will make us live forever and make us age miserably uh, with all uh, the many diseases that you added there in this, this slide that was mounting up and is really disturbing and it's the whole truth. So the one thing that we are ready to go and we are really good at is the compression of morbidity part or the Dorian Gray case, right? Dorian Gray uh, didn't get older, but when he looked at the mirror, the mirror get, got older. And I, I, I like this example, not only because this is what my research is about, but every morning I look at the mirror and I'm thinking that I'm Dorian Gray. I'm saying, oh, I'm aging only in the mirror and I'm going on and doing my, my own stuff. And um, I think Matt and I are dealing some with some things that are showing compression of morbidity, but I'll make the point later more apropos our centenarians, which are the existing group of people who, uh, who slows aging and they die, uh, they die uh, you know, quite fast at the end of their life without, without disease, without even having a disease. The next part, um, the next pathway is, well, I put there a picture, that, well, it's the Wolverine get, case. I didn't get the good picture of the Wolverine, but it's really the fountain of youth. It's this idea that you can take old people, get them in this bath, and now they're coming out younger. And I'm telling you, I don't think this is going to happen or not in our lifetime, but what is happening right now there are several um, geriotherapeutics that we can give to elder, at least animals, but also there's evidence from elderly people. We can give them and we can reverse a lot of the health issues in aging. Not, not making them young, but making them much better. So this concept is actually real and we are working on that. And the last one, which I think is going eventually to, to be the easiest for us to do is the forever young or the Peter Pan case that you don't get old, you're forever young. Um, and think of it that, think of it as, you know, when you're 20 years old, you come to the clinic once a week or once a month or once a year, and you'll get the treatment that will erase the aging part of your um, of, of, of your DNA that says, stands on your DNA and, and maybe some other uh, effects. And then you'll grow not at all or maybe very slowly. Um, and there are examples, initial examples of things that are looking at that too. <laughs> so this is the context by which we're looking at it. And I'll tell you, Life expect. If you wanna, uh, you wanna get the scientific answer. The best paper was by Jan Vig in Nature a couple of years ago, and it's a statistical paper, and he shows that maximum lifespan for human species is 115 years old. Okay, uh, we are dying, as you said, before the age of 78. So there's 37 years to actually try start to work out without being dramatic and we without figuring out how we change our being and and our you know and do something so dramatic that will get even longer not that it's not possible but we don't need to think of it at this reason so the second and last point i want to make is um the, uh, the question i have 750 centenarians and i have their offspring really all of them could be other pictures of the runner and her mother. And we asked, are they going, are they getting disease when everybody gets disease? And now they are living 40 years longer with disease or is their health span and life spent together? And what you see here from two different studies in red and, and green are the control and in a uh, blue and, and red are the centenarians from two, two different studies. And you see that the centenarians are living um, 30, 40 years, 20, 30 years longer, healthier without all those disease here. But the most important part of it is not the fact that they are living healthier as they're living longer. Not that this is 
our capacity, but their contraction of morbidity, so they spend very little time sick at the end of their lives. And even the CDC here have looked at the last, uh, the medical cost in the last two years of life of somebody who dies at 100 versus somebody who dies at 70, and it's third the cost. And we have, since 1993, we have this evidence. So the idea is let's achieve health span, let's decrease uh, uh, morbidity, and this would be a good step for us and for the economy. I can't hear you. Uh, Ken, you're on mute. I'm gonna ask you a question or two and then we'll hear from Matt and then all three of us will try to make sense of this. So what have you concluded about how and why these centenarians live longer and live better? I mean, is it blue zones? Is it water? Is it wine? Is it genetics? Tell us. Okay, there, there, we had three hypotheses. One is the blue zone hypothesis, let's call it that way, that they just happen to interact with the environment the way now uh, we know was good. And the answer was not at all. 60% of the centenarians, uh, men and 30% of the women were smokers. 50% of them were overweight or obese. Uh, exercise, even moderate exercise, even housework, walking, biking, less than 50%, vegetarian, 2%. So the point for us is that they got there anyhow, no matter what we, we threw of them because they had this resiliency. Well, the second theory was maybe they have the perfect genome because we know that there's lots of genetic underlying many age-related diseases. And we found to our surprise that those guys had on average six mutations that should have made them sick and they're not sick and they're alive at 100 years old. By the way, we have centenarians who have ApoE4 mutation that's supposed to kill you, uh, to, to dement you when you're 70 and kill you when they're 80 and they're 100 and not demented. So, so it's not that. Uh, what we've been finding since then is longevity genes, several longevity genes, several pathways that have allowed them to slow their aging enough so that they can handle bad genes and the environment and get healthy anyhow. Well, wow. one last question. Um, so you're just a kid, you're 64 now. So in your lifetime, in the decades to come, there'll be many, many, many new insights and breakthroughs. How long do you think you might live? Um, so if, if uh, you, you know, <laughs> the, the answer changes, you know, when, when uh, I was asked how, what's aging, it was always 10 years older than me, right? So <laughs> it's changing all the time. I would tell you that until I was 60, I would have made the deal of being healthy until 85 and dying the next day. I would accept that. Now that I'm, by the way, going to be 67. <laughs> oh, I got that wrong. All right. I'm sorry. I, I have second thoughts. And, and, and in a certain way, my frustration is because, and I understand all of us geroscientists that became older, we know that we can do something about that. And we are kind of pushing it and it, and it doesn't happen really fast. But I, I think that, that probably uh, b b b as, as things will accelerate, as there'll be more gerotherapeutics, I would probably be able to push maybe 85 more. I, I hope so, if, if, if my wife agrees with that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's keep building on the plot line here. We have an extraordinary, really a youngster, a 50 year old. So who can remember being 50, but with maybe another 50 or more years of science in front of Matt Kaberling is the director of the Healthy Aging and Longevity Research Institute at the University of Washington and has done some of the most absolutely brilliant work about genomics, uh, oral health, uh, life expectancy of dogs, and humans. And, and Matt, uh, take us into your world. How do you look at all of this? Uh, thanks, Ken. Um, uh, can we move to the next slide, please? 
Um, so I want to start by sort of building on um, what Nir was saying, and particularly in the area of gerotherapeutics, which I think, you know, have the potential to, to certainly push health span, you know, much closer to that, that theoretical maximal lifespan limit that, that Nir mentioned of 115 years, and maybe even get us past that. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty exciting time. And I want to start, though, by um, really just making the point that uh, that that this idea this of targeting the biology of aging or geroscience is not science fiction and it is science fact, and the field has made I think a lot of progress in the last couple of decades at understanding the the mechanisms of biological aging, and that's what's represented in this slide. This is sort of a famous graphic um, called the hallmarks of aging. Um, which represent evolutionarily conserved molecular mechanisms of biological aging. Um, and for the purposes of today's talk, it doesn't really matter what these are, but I think it's important to just make the point that, that while we still have a lot to learn about the biology of aging, we've made progress to the point where we, we actually have targets that we can go after with these gerotherapeutics and in principle targeting any one of these and you know obviously it would be more effective to target all of them at the same time that that is the mechanism by which we can have an impact on biological aging and maximize health span and and hopefully also increase healthy longevity um next slide please and these are just some of the interventions that we know about this is not meant to be a comprehensive list um, if your favorite intervention isn't on here, I apologize. Uh, but I really just wanted to make the point that we now have strategies. Some of them are along the lines of lifestyle strategies. Some of them are gerotherapeutics that Nir was referring to, small molecules that target those hallmarks of aging. And in laboratory animals, increase lifespan and appear to broadly improve health span. Um, and, and I just want to mention a couple of these dietary restrictions. Take us through all of them, Matt. They're, they're, we'd love to hear what you've selected and why. Sure. So, so dietary restriction um, is the best characterized intervention for increasing lifespan. And the magnitude of effect is pretty big, up to about a 50 to 60% increase in lifespan. I think most of us would um, recognize that, that dietary restriction or caloric restriction probably isn't feasible for the general public to adopt. But there are different strategies that people are taking in the area of nutrition, which we can talk about. And Ken alluded to some of these dietary interventions that are catching the mainstream attention that may impact the biology of aging. Um, I also just want to briefly mention rapamycin. I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I think it's useful to look at these magnitudes of effect and how quickly they drop off. And this is in mice. These are percent effects on lifespan in mice. Um, it's harder to quantify percent effects on health span. I'm going to come back to this point in my last slide because I think this is actually a challenge that we need to overcome in the field is, is how few interventions we have that actually have large effects on longevity in mice. Um, next slide, please. So I want to also make the point that, um, you know, Nir talked about these different potential modes that we could go through, the Peter Pan or, or Dorian Gray. Um, uh, and, and so one of them, you know, Nir mentioned is treating young individuals, um, and that may ultimately be the strategy that has the most effect. One of the things that's been most exciting for me is this growing um, line of evidence that we don't have to do that, though, to have significant effects on health span and lifespan, that we can actually start treatment in middle age, sometimes even transient treatments and get pretty big effects. And this is just an example from my own research. We published this a few years ago where we we treated old mice with rapamycin for three months. So they were about the mouse equivalent of a 60 year old person. We treated them for three months. And then we asked, what is the effect on survival after that? And this is just the outcome where we saw in this particular group, about a 60% increase in life expectancy from the end of that transient treatment. So we don't know whether this will be equivalent in people, or if it is, you know, will it be a linear extrapolation? But if we just do that linear extrapolation, that's about two decades for a typical 50 year old woman. So we're talking about, you know, reasonably significant potential effects on life, life expectancy. Next slide, please. And I think again, getting back to this critically important um, point, whoop, I lost my slides. Um, what we've seen with rapamycin, uh, can you guys hear me? I feel like I might be frozen. We do can hear you. Hear you? Matt? but we do not see the slides. Yeah, I don't see them either. So Ken, if you can have those slides, I think that you're handling them, that would be wonderful. Would it be helpful if I share my screen? 
Yes, go ahead if you possibly can. Yeah, I've got the, the And there's a wonderful Robin that we see there, who's helping as well. There you go. Can you see him? Okay. Very good. Okay, so I wanted to just um, make the point though that we're not only uh, thinking about this in the context of lifespan and at least with rapamycin and this seems to be true with other interventions as well, um, it appears to broadly impact health span. And so there, this is a, a partial list of the tissues and organs where rapamycin treatment in mice has been shown to have a positive impact uh, on the function of those tissues and organs. And in at least three cases, taking old mice and treating them in old age, you can actually see rejuvenation of function. So that's very clear in the heart. It's very clear in the immune system. And obviously that's got some, some pretty significant relevance considering the world that we live in today. And in the, the, the oral cavity where uh, short-term treatment with rapamycin has been shown to reverse periodontal disease. So again, we don't know whether it's these rapamycin or these other gerotherapeutics will have the same effects in people, but I really just want to make the point, you know, there's this myth that Nir and I and others in the field, we're just talking about slowing down aging. No, that doesn't seem to be the case. It actually seems to be the case that you can re rejuvenate function in an old animal and potentially in an old person. And, and I think that's, that's a reason to be excited. Um, and I'm controlling my slides now. So I'll just finish up with uh, a couple of um, thoughts that I have on, on both the challenges that we face as a field and potential opportunities. Um, so I, I think it's clear that, you know, moving out of the lab into the real world is a critical next step for the field. Um, but in order to do that, we have to get over some challenges with regulatory hurdles and, you know, how do people get drugs approved through the FDA for targeting the biology of aging? And um, I'm sure we'll talk about some of these strategies. Nair has really been the leader or, or at least one of the leaders in this area with the targeting aging with metformin clinical trial. Other people are thinking about other strategies to get FDA approval for targeting aging. Um, we've been working at the Dog Aging Project on clinical trials with lifespan as the primary endpoint and then health span metrics as the secondary endpoints in uh, companion animals and pet dogs. And it's exciting for me to see companies now moving into this space. An example of that is Loyal. And then I think a lot of people are thinking about surrogate endpoints, biomarkers, clocks that potentially at some point might be used for FDA approval, or at least as evidence towards FDA approval. Um, I think we all recognize that there's a lack of federal funding for the biology of, of aging research. Um, it's about one half of 1% of the NIH budget goes to biology of aging. So that slide that Ken showed where it was like two cents on the dollar for, for biomedical research in general, or 20 cents on the dollar, it's about one one hundredth of that or one two hundredth of that that goes to the biology of aging, despite the fact that aging is the single greatest risk factor for most of the diseases that NIH um, is focused on. So that I think, you know, we're still a ways away, but but there's at least talk now and growing momentum, I think, for, for a geroscience moonshot that could potentially dramatically increase federal funding for aging research. It's exciting to see longevity biotech blooming. And, um, and then I think it's also exciting to see major philanthropy in this field um, start, and hopefully that will continue. Uh, another challenge is we have to convince the medical community that targeting aging is 21st century medicine. Um, and differentiate that from the old way of waiting until people are sick and trying to cure their disease. And I think we're having some success in outreach to the medical community and we're starting to see longevity medicine courses for physicians and healthcare professionals. And that's a, that's a good thing. And the last point I wanna make is getting back to the gerotherapeutics and the interventions. Um, I talked about how the, the efficacy <laughs> drops off really quickly with the interventions that we know about. Um, and really most of the interventions that people are moving forward with today have about 10 to 15% effects on survival in mice. Um, and I think that's partly because most of the field is looking under the lamppost at things we know, at the networks we know. And I really would like to see us broaden that out and think bigger. And I think um, particularly combinatorial interactions, this came up in the last session, are, are one of the places we should be looking. And I'm excited by the development of high throughput technologies that can facilitate this combined with artificial intelligence. I think that's gonna have a big impact and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to, to identify interventions that have much bigger effect sizes than the ones we know about today. Fantastic. Uh, and I will stop there. Let me stop my sharing. So let's, yeah, and let me, let me open Open up. We're going to have 10 minutes before I introduce Adrian uh, for us to mix it up a little bit. I'm going to begin with you, Matt. So I'm old enough. You're not. 
but I'm old enough to remember when Pong appeared. It was this very simple-minded game that you could play on your TV screen, and it seemed like this is the most amazing thing I've ever encountered. Now look at the state of video games. Let's imagine for a second that the state of geosciences is, is equivalent to Pong. It's fantastic, but it's just the beginning. If you open up your newspaper 20 years from now, and there are three breakthroughs talked about that have altered the way we age, what do you think they're going to be? And I realize you're not a science fiction person, <laughs> so I know I'm asking you to go outside yeah. your, your lab coat. Yeah, no, I think that's okay. So I have a couple of thoughts on that. One is, um, uh, I'll answer your question in a second, but but I, I would, I'm generally an optimist, but you know, this point I made about intervention stagnation, if you asked me 15 years ago, you know, would there be a nature paper looking at, at time restricted feeding and showing a 10% or 15% increase in lifespan in fruit flies? I would have said, no, I would have hoped the field would be much much further along than that. But it turns out there was just a nature paper published on exactly that. So while I wanna be optimistic, I think we need to push ourselves to get there. And I feel like things have slowed down in, in some ways. So now I'll answer your question. What might be the big breakthroughs? I, I think you know there's a lot of interest in epigenetic reprogramming right now. The idea that we can use um, factors to reverse the marks on DNA that are associated with aging. Nobody knows at this point how effective that's gonna be at, at maximizing health span or lifespan because nobody has actually published any data showing that you can have a significant impact in the context of biological aging from that strategy. But I think conceptually, there could be big impacts from that. So let's just say you know that somebody can double the lifespan of a mouse by epigenetic reprogramming. Then I think you know that could be a strategy, right? That would have large right, impacts. So that's one. That's let's, one. Let's, let's put that in the time castle. What is another breakthrough that you think will have occurred 20 years from now? Well, so I didn't say it would occur. I said, let's be hopeful, right? right. <laughs> so I, 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 I alluded to combinations of interventions. I think that's something that really hasn't been explored at all. Now, you know, some people might think that's boring um, because that's just taking two or more things we already know about. But, but the fact is we haven't really tried. And I think that there may be opportunities for large effects from combining interventions. Um, you know, We'll just have to we'll have to find out. Um, and then the third, I guess, would be you know it's hard to predict um, how effective and fast things are going to move on the sort of organ regeneration front, right? I think people have been excited about the idea that we can just replace our tissues and organs as we get older through you know engineering, mostly engineering, bioengineering mechanisms. Um, it's a little bit hard to know how how fast that's going to move, but I think that 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 could be you know a, a reality within the next. 10 or 15 years, at least initially. I'm concerned about how we do that with the brain though. I think we can be successful at that, doing that with the rest of the body. I think we're still a long ways away from being able to do that with the brain. So, you know, it really sort of depends. And I wanna come back also quickly. I know I'm talking a lot, but um, you know, something Nir said, I think is something that, that everybody in this field struggles with, which is that we know how to do some of this now. It is almost guaranteed that some of these interventions can have a positive impact on human health and longevity, but the pace of actually getting it into the clinic and doing that is so slow that it leads to a lot of a lot of frustration, and that's why it's hard for me to really, you know, get too excited about where we're going to be ten years now. All right, so Nir, I'm going to turn to you with a similar question, but let me also put a little weight on your shoulders here. So there may not have ever been a human being who has thought more about this subject on planet Earth than you. I mean, think about it, the work you've done, the labs you've overseen, the projects you've managed, the centenarians you've encountered. You're a special guy. You're like tip of the spear. 20 years from now, your wife permitting, you're still alive. You, uh, you look in the newspaper and you see three breakthroughs that, have ch that will change aging and health and longevity. What do you think they're going to be? Yeah, but you know, I'll, I'll take Matt approach and I'll talk a little bit on, 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 on the periphery and, 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 the, and then I'll, I'll put my hammer on. Okay. But first of all, I think some of the things that we're talking about, uh, like tissue regeneration, Matt said that, and like CRISPR is not necessarily going to be so relevant for aging in the near future in my mind. There is much better way to target aging than to do it with CRISPR or with the like, genetic like therapy. What? Do what? Oh, you look, 
<laughs> my my uh, centenarian study is about finding genes. So uh, we found genes associated with aging for two pharmaceuticals. Merck and Ionis came and says, we're interested in what you did and, and they've developed medicine and, you know, third trial because the genes were either inhibiting or, or, or accelerating some action, right? So mostly you can actually design, design a drug, okay? It's not so often that you need, you know, there are genetic defects, really bad genetic defects that you cannot fix. But for most of what we're talking by targeting those hallmarks, there's a lot of drug that you, you can develop. And another example is, I've never, I said it in the last session, but hyperbaric oxygen. I was advising them from early on because I said, let's not kill people. In fact, by the way, we, one of the things that we're trying is not kill anyone on the, re, on the way to success, right? We want the FDA to be there and we don't, we don't wanna show casualties. And I said, wow, hyperbaric medicine that's taking human, putting them in those submarines, increasing the pressure, you know, taking them down deep with 100% oxygen. Oxygen is a terrible toxin. You know, we, we, all our life was about protecting us from the oxidative effect. We take antioxidants, right? Now, it happens that our thinking was probably wrong. And the major thing that happens is oxygen gets to cells who didn't have a good vascular perfusion and were really enjoying oxygen and were st st starting to rejuvenate. And you can see that stem cells are increasing the animals model in humans. So what I'm trying to say, and I, and I don't know, there is no clinical trial. So I don't want to, I don't want to sound like I, I mean that, but some of the things that are coming are left field, totally unpredictable. And I'm sure whatever I'm answering, I'm answering you now next, is actually not going to be the one in 20 years. But I do think, I do think that uh, erasing uh, the epigenetic of aging is going to be very promising. Look, you can take a 70 year old uh, sperm and a 50 year old egg and fertilize it. And when the blastocyst is formed, they don't remember the age of the parents, right? You start from zero all the time. We figured it out in our own body and we started, there are some actually um, companies that have started using this by using Yamamoto factors and really rejuvenating a, a stem cell and erasing aging. Okay, question for both of you gentlemen. Is what you're describing improving health? Is what you're describing altering aging? Is what you're describing something other than this? Matt. Uh, yes, I think is the answer to all of those things. Uh, um, so I think, you know, certainly what, what, what I've been describing and, and near as well are targeting those hallmarks of aging. So again, you know, it depends a little bit on how you define aging. And I think that's where we actually get into a lot of trouble because different people define aging differently and mean different things and people get upset, but they really agree, but they just have different definitions. Um, so I'm talking about the biology of aging, right? The biological processes that that cause an old organism okay. to have a different physiology so, than a young so organism. So for you, you're talking about improving health and also altering the aging dynamic. Right, so, so I think the question is, can can those things be uncoupled, right? Can, could you increase lifespan without improving health span? This is a little bit controversial in the field. Um, I've never seen anything in a mouse that uncouples those things. So yes, when you extend lifespan, you also improve health span it does seem to be the case that you might be able to go the other way and improve health span without increasing. Well, let's say I had Alzheimer's and you increased my lifespan. I just have Alzheimer's longer. So, right. But, but what I just said is that doesn't seem to happen. Right. So that's the concern, but okay. I've never seen anything in a mouse that does that. Just because we're tight on time I, near where yeah, do you I, come out. Are you talking about aging, stopping aging, improving health? What? Yeah, let, let, me, let me just say, Matt, the one example that really sticks in my mind is the senolytics. So you give the senolytics and you improve health parameters everywhere, metabolic and functional and everything. They still don't extend their maximal lifespan, okay? They just become healthy. So, so it is possible that some of what we'll do will only increase health span if, if this is a, a good example. Look, otherwise... I agree with Matt. I, I, I say, because I'm a physician, I'll say differently. It's the story of the 
old couple that lives in a house in the Middle West. And the woman turns to the man and says, honey, should we go upstairs and make love? And the husband le- uh, looks at her and say, I cannot do both. Okay, so <laughs> we, have, we have to return the functionality. You know, we are lucky in New York, we live in an apartment on the same level. We don't have those functional problems so much, but, <laughs> but, uh, but that's what we're trying to restore. Okay, one quick question of either of you gentlemen, then I'm going to introduce Adrian and we're going to widen the discussion a bit. If you, if somebody gave you an extra hundred billion dollars to invest in order to bring about what you're hoping for, what would you invest in? Each of you, first near. Yeah, you know, I was asked about billion dollars and it was hard for me to find a solution. Um, uh, I would, first of all, bribe politicians, okay? And, and lobby and make them understand that this hundred billion dollars is going to bring trillions to the economy so that they recognize that. I would increase the pipeline, you know, because we were lucky. We were, you know, Matt and me, we, we were looking at models of longevity and we learned a lot about aging, but not everything. We're not done by any way. And those are not the only hallmarks that we have. So we need to have a pipeline of mechanisms, of ideas, of, of targets. And we, most important, the FDA has to understand that there's another way to look at it because we cannot solve the aging problem with a 20 year perspective of getting an indication. Got it, Matt. Where, where would you take, not a billion, hundred billion dollars, where would you put it? And be, yeah. be brief, please. All right, so I would, I would uh, invest in a dedicated PR campaign to change the public view of geroscience and aging and healthy longevity. Um, I would invest in obviously research, especially for young investigators. I think if you if you put the money out there, they will come. We've seen that in other areas. And I would put a lot into developing strategies for clinical trials to move things that we know about today into the clinic and figure out if they really work. Thank you. We're going to return to all sorts of things. Uh, but what I need now, and I'm not sure how Bruce Frankel got on the screen, uh, but I'm going to introduce Adrian, and we're going to add more dimensionality to this. As some of you know, Adrian Bird is the executive director of the Catalis Institute, which is the organizer of this conference. Uh, she's also one of the founders of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys. She is a lawyer. And as best as I can tell, she's also the only Emmy winning producer on this program. And she's also the author of 14 books, by the way, she's also the eldest among us at 73. So I'm gonna ask Matt and Nir if you'll close your mics down. And Adrian, why don't you tell us what you think the challenge or opportunity is about living to 120 or even 150? Yes, I'm gonna take uh, the lawyer's point of view and I'm gonna make a case for living to 150 societally and in our own thinking and our own attitudes. Uh, but first, I'm going to take a look a bit at the science. Uh, there's a good reason that Nir and Matt do not say that we're going to live to 150, even 120, because we seem to have a natural lifespan. And when you take a look at those who feel that we could do that, they call themselves transhumanists or posthumanists. In other words, if we can make this 150, this is not thinking of ourselves as we are today just healthier and living longer and older as we would if we talk about 100, 115, even up to 120. There's a difference. That difference could be that we would be people of many parts, robotic parts. I like to say I'm 73 and only some parts of me are still good. But I could could exchange a hip, I could exchange teeth. My mom lived for an extra uh, 12 years because she had a pacemaker. So we can do some of that today and a transhumanist would say we could do that with all of our body eventually. There are other tricks like freezing, like changing brains, like uh, downloading our brain into the cloud and having no bodies. So of course, the geroscientists of today don't want to be mixed up with those optics because they're having a hard enough uh, trouble uh, convincing people we could live to 100 and 120. But what would happen if we believed that we could live to 150 as healthy human beings? How would that change society and what would we have to create 
to make that a wonderful world. Well, my case is that if we think that way, we will make it a better world today for people who can live to 190, 115, as we see from Nir and, and Matt that this all can happen. So let me give you a little bit of a chart without giving you a slide. In 1900, the average age was approximately 47, as Ken showed you. What if people thought they could live twice that long? Well, that's what we're doing today. And what if me at 73 could believe I could live twice that long and I was in the midst of life? That would bring me thinking that I could make it to 150, what changes would take place? I'm gonna go through six very quickly. All of them, except two, very beneficial. One, there would be an entirely new concept of adulthood. Adulthood would be a contributory, exciting phase, not something that we did not look forward to. And that would require a structural change, changes in our feeling about ageism, changing in our feelings about what it meant to be busy. Ask a retiree today, they'll tell you that they're busy. Well, they have to work hard at being busy because there is no real place for contribution right now. And imagine if we had 50 years of that, where we had to work hard at being busy. We have a United Nations that's trying to get an equity for older adults. We have the Older Americans Act in this country. I can tell you as a lawyer, once you have to have acts, treaties and conventions, there's something wrong. And so we would be developing a whole new concept of adulthood and we can do that right now. Second thing that would be happening, and this is fascinating to me, is a change in life pacing. And there's a biologic issue to this and there's a societal issue. Societally, we would work longer. We would go to school longer. We would have time to write that book. We would time to have multiple careers, but we could do some of that right now. We could also stop and smell the roses if we felt that we had more time in our life. The most horrible thing I've ever heard is, and it's supposed to be exciting, live every day as if it was your last. Well, I would be under the covers with cheesecake. I don't want every day to be my last. I want to feel that I have long years. This would take the pressure of young people today also to get busy and get to work before they even know who they are. But there's a biologic issue too, to life pacing. When you study uh, cultures where people do live shorter lives, you will see that the girls can actually have babies much younger in life, nine to 13 years old. In longer lived communities, you can't. Uh, 15, 16 becomes an age where you can actually give birth. Well, let's look at the other way around. I gave birth when I was 44. If we think about longer life biologically, we may be having babies later in life. We would have more kinds of grandparents and more kinds of contribution in later life to family. Our anthropologists tell us that uh, the reason we don't die after giving birth is that grandparents still have a role in society of bringing food. Well, we don't do that anymore. If we're going to live longer, we probably are going to have to take on more contributory roles for the family. Another area is money. We think about money as wealth. One person has more money than the other. If we live to 150, it would be more income than wealth. The wealthiest person would be the one that could sustain themselves. And so I foresee a completely different financial future, uh, different kinds of investing. We now have a bankrupt uh, system when it comes to Medicare, Medicaid, uh, we are really using our own tax dollars, not at trust fund dollars. This would have to change. And if you ask me, uh, one of the great groups that's missing at our very conference today are the actuaries. Where are you? You should be here measuring new lifespans and taking a look at the kind of financial products that allow us to live that long. When I speak, I ask people uh, about this. You're gonna live longer, that's the good news. You can't afford it, that's the bad news. We're gonna to have to be able to have a money system that allows us to afford it. And finally, on the good side, we will all become environmentalists. You know, our kids are mad at us because they say baby boomers have left the planet in a shambles. And I'm still one of the oldest baby boomers, but I'm still a baby boomer, so I get that from my kids. Uh, but what if we live to 150? Every one of us would become environmentalists overnight because even if Matt and Nia and all the great gero scientists and even the transhumanists helped us live to 150, it's not gonna help if we have fires, hurricanes, and a kind of climate that we can't control. So this would make a real difference in our own thinking because environmentalism right now is a legacy. But if we lived longer, it would be for us. And now I'm gonna end with the two negatives here. 
I don't know that I want the entire world to be there and be the same. I would like new ideas, continued reinvention, continued creativity. And this is actually a geroscience neurological issue. I did uh, interview a young lady who was a master scientist, a neuroscientist at UCLA working on lifelong learning. And this is what she taught me. She said, Adrian, it's not about actually taking courses and learning more. It's learning how to learn. And there are neurons that we all share that can create new pathways, not so much for learning anything in particular, but for continuing to learn how to learn. We have that issue in technology, in digital technology, where we are often reluctant just because of our age to learn the new technologies, which will be exponentially new if we are living that long. Every day there will be a new technology. So we do have to work with the neuroscientists, not just on issues of dementia, if we can beat that, and we're all over that because of Nir's great new genes that'll prevent that. We also have to look at neuroscience and gerontology and geroscience as again, breaking the silos between them so that we can take that, what they call crystallized intelligence or wisdom, but also infuse a little bit of fluid intelligence or quick learning into us, into ourselves if we get older. So, and last year is equity. I think I'm very worried about the fact that some people will be able to buy this long life and others won't. And that's why at Catalyst we say healthy longevity for all. We're going to have to beat that problem of the inequality of being able to buy extra years on this planet. So that, that's what I see here as possibility of assuming we're going to live to 150 and living into it personally and societally right now. First of all, appreciating your, your thoughtfulness. I have two quick questions for you. And I'm gonna first build on the last one. When we watch billionaires taking rocket ships up to wherever they wanna go, um, I think that's a little bit of a hint towards the future. How would you feel if there was profound longevity inequality that somebody for a million or $10 million could buy their way to a healthier gene infrastructure and an extra 50 years of life and the rest of the population could not? Is that okay? No, it is not okay. Uh, there's a big difference uh, between people that have a Mercedes Benz or Rolls Royce and people that have a bicycle. That's, that's a material thing. But the ability to buy more years on the planet is of a different order. It's probably of an order of inequality we have never ever faced before, even more so than um, access to let's say good dentistry or doctors. It, it makes a, a distinction for who should be here based on something very artificial, which is whether they can afford it or not. And I think we have to fight that uh, and, uh, really on every single front. And it is happening. It's happening today in a lot of levels. Not At the just, age of 50 today, the top decile financially has a 15 year higher life expectancy than people at the bottom decile. So we're already in massive longevity absolutely. inequality, but what you're saying is, we should fix that. That's not the future we want to be creating. I have well, one other question can, to ask you. Can, can I just quickly say, they're not going anywhere now, but if they want to go somewhere like to Mars, they have to fix aging first. So let's call them to do that. <laughs> now, I heard I'm, Elon I'm, Musk said he hopes to die on Mars, but not on impact. So, Right, but, but let me get a little bit down to I, I have a question for you, my friend. What would the purpose be if we're going to have 80 and 90 year olds who will still be, let's say, in a prime, still be vital. What's the purpose of such people? Well, there's two things. One, if we were thinking about life pacing, uh, they would still be working. We would be creating jobs for people all along the age continuum. So they would be actually working and making contribution. But uh, I work just as hard in my volunteer life as I do in my paid life. And one of the things that we do forget is that volunteerism is at, uh, for actually Americans uh, volunteer more percentage wise than any other Western country, but still very, very little. People will still have needs. Uh, just because you're living old, longer and healthier does not mean that you uh, don't have many other needs that we can volunteer. Okay. So we need okay. a completely different view of what it means to be a volunteer, maybe even a wholly different word and an aspiration. That's the point. Our aspiration now is leisure. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, so we need new aspirations with a new lifelong span. We could and we will go on for years to come in discussions about this, but I'm going to do a, something we had not planned. I'm going to do a lightning round. I'm going to mention a technology, and I want you guys just to give a thumbs up or a thumbs down as, as to whether you favor it. Okay? Okay. Um, infusing with the blood of young people. All <laughs> <laughs> the scientists. Well, uh, um, the alternative. If it works, if it's it works. not wrong. Wait, 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 I don't want any discussion. Just thumbs up, thumbs down. Um, electroceuticals, using electricity to stimulate health in the body, like Martine Rothblatt is working towards. I do it now. Okay. Hyperbaric chambers. <laughs> um, mega vitamin supplementation. No. <laughs> um, intermittent fasting. This is so great to see the differences. All right, just a couple of more. Uh, downloading your uh, identity into software so that whether your body continues or not, you will live to a thousand as uh, whoever you think you are. <laughs> really? really. Um, and last, having a massive preventative guidance infrastructure so that people can do all the things that maybe you guys think they ought to do. Got it. Okay, so here's how we're gonna wind up our session. We're each gonna have one minute. That's all, because we're gonna be shut off in about four and a half minutes. And I want each of you to tell me what your hope is for the future of human health, human aging, and human longevity. Take a moment to think what your hope is, and it could even be a word or a short sentence. Who'd like to go first? Irving, Irving Here. Khan, one of my favorite centenarian uh, who's running a hedge fund of $720 million. We said, what will happen if we'll take it away? And he'll say, I'll buy it back. <laughs> the, idea, the idea that you can be healthy at age 105 is absolutely achievable. Some people have done it successfully. Thank you. Who'd like to go next? Well, I, I'm in order here. So All right, Andrew. There's, there's two phrases I love. Well, everybody who says it can't be done, get out of the way of the people who are doing it. <laughs> so, the, so that's number one. I believe it can be done. And the other I love is the bigger the why, the easier the how. If you have a really big why to live long, then it's easier to do so. And uh, I want everybody to have a very big why. Matt. So I I'm an optimist by nature and I don't want to put bounds on anything. So uh, optimistically, I'm all for extreme life extension as long as people are healthy. Realistically, you know, you asked the question, I think of Nir of, you know, uh, uh, how old would you want to be, right? And I think I would answer that question now. I would like to be healthy to over a hundred. And I hope that like Nir, when I get, older, that that number will continue to go up. Thank you. So I'm going to offer my concluding comments. And um, first, I think it's quite spectacular that the human species have gotten to this point where we could have a discussion like this at a conference like this to contemplate how we doing with regard to longevity, not so great for most, what fixes could we make? Uh, second, I think that like Adrian said, that we need an entirely new purpose. I was in, I was with the Maasai tribe in, out in Kenya right before COVID and the older people are called elders and the younger people call themselves junior elders. They like the idea of becoming an old person. We live in a very ageist society where people think you're supposed to stay young forever. This idea that we might imagine a six generation life course. Third, um, boy, I agree with the point made earlier about we have got to really stir up an entirely different discussion and framing for scientists, for young professionals, for young students, for older people with power and influence and investment folks, so that we can build a model for creating what you folks have been describing. And last, I want to say that um, I want to express for all of us uh, at the Metabesity Conference, uh, my gratefulness to you, Matt, and to you, Nir, for the extraordinarily 
powerful and smart scientific intelligence you bring to this subject. So wishing all the best, stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you guys so much. I'm gonna hand this off to Tom Sale, the executive director, who's gonna transition us to the very next program. Everybody be well. Thank Bravo, you, panel. Thank you so much, Ken and Matt and Mir and Adrian. Uh, great food for thought. Uh, a great contribution to uh, a, a conference so far of wonderful sessions.